my testimony is an evidence of the strength of God's grace and the kindness and goodness of his person. How he strove with me and brought me back, not because of anything in me, but because of the goodness that dwells in him. I was born into a godly family and raised in a godly home. My earliest memories are of the assembly at 78th and Independence and of being among the brethren of like precious faith. Shortly before my seventh birthday, I began to really take note that the brethren were being called brother and sister, and that sister did not come before my name. I asked my mother why this was and told her that I wanted to be Sister Eva, that I wanted Sister Eva on the front of my Bible. Her answer was that I wasn't baptized yet. This answer prompted a plethora of questions from me. I was told that when you are baptized, you not only become a sister, but your sins are washed away and your name is put in the Lamb's Book of Life. I wanted all of these things to happen to me. In discussing it further, I began to see that being a sister was a change that had to be made. <clears throat> it was not something that you were just born into. In August of 1992, I made the Confession of Faith and was baptized with my twin brothers. I remember at the time considering myself a spiritual triplet. <laughs> my parents were faithful in nurturing in me a desire for the things of God, and my faith grew as a result. The more I learned about God, the more I loved him. I wanted to be like him, and I wanted to be where he was. My seventh year was very memorable for me, not only because it was the year I was baptized, but because it was also the year that I began to recognize God's tokens of his love for me. Soon after this, my parents told our family that we were going to move to a strange land called Joplin, Missouri. Even though I was very upset and very vocal about being upset, about leaving everything and everyone I knew, there were blessings that I did not anticipate. Among them, an answered prayer <clears throat> for a believer that would be a true friend and would always be my friend. After we arrived in Joplin, I was introduced to a girl who was my age. God knit my heart with hers and together we grew up in the faith. 20 years later, Sister Rebecca Scalf is still my closest friend and has been a great helper to my faith. The same year of my baptism and receiving the answer to my prayer, my brother Benjamin was diagnosed with a highly malignant brain tumor. It was during this first test of my faith that I learned to cast my cares upon the Lord and to trust him. It was frightening to me at such a young age to have to try and prepare myself for what could happen. Because of the good example of my parents, I was able to have confidence that even though I did not want my brother to die, if he did, he would be with God. I was able to find comfort in that. There were many righteous men and women that prayed for Benjamin's healing. Not long after his diagnosis because of these prayers, Benjamin was pronounced cancer free. His cancer has never reoccurred. I was able to see God's hand at work through this time and was able to be thankful and acknowledge that he had sustained us. And even though I am very thankful for the doctors that took care of Benjamin, I know that his healing was from God. Amen. Faith is something that has to be maintained. 
You don't get a free pass because of whose child you are or what you did in the past. Amen. Keeping the faith is a present action. Since increasing my faith was starting to become secondary, I stopped maintaining it as I should have. In middle school, I became friends with someone who was not a bad person, but who was not an entirely good influence. As a direct result of this friendship, a bitter seed was planted, and I began to develop a taste for the things of this world and entered into a time of rebellion and being a grief to my parents. Because of my age and living under my parents' roof, I was not allowed to sat satisfy this newfound appetite. My parents had committed to serving God. There was no other option. <clears throat> I remember being told on more than one occasion that it was not all about me, that if I lived only for myself, I would never be truly satisfied because only God could satisfy. Amen. There were times that I was sensitive to the Lord. The only problem with it was it was not consistent. I always returned to ungodliness like a dog to its vomit. This pattern continued until I turned 26. It was then that I moved out of my parents' house and into a small apartment. I'm very ashamed of this time in my life because it was not marked with godliness. In my mind, I was free to do things that I should not have done. I knew not to do certain things and not to go against what believers deem cardinal rules, and I didn't for a while. But when you stay in an ungodly environment, eventually you will find that the things you once considered truly bad do not seem so bad anymore. I didn't participate in everything, but it was still more than enough to develop a strong appetite for the world. <clears throat> I remember all of my excuses. It's just this one time. I haven't done this in a while. And this is the last time I will do this. How many times I said it would be the last time or more than I can count. The memory of what I had been taught as a child often came to mind, but I brushed it aside to fulfill my carnal desires. The thought came to me in my preparations that I could have died during this time. I was able to thank God immediately that he preserved me alive. It is a chilling thought to consider where I would have gone had he not. I started to become sensitive to the Lord again, but also began to feel that I had fallen too far. I knew God wasn't pleased with me. Because of my love for classic literature, I had accumulated a great many books of poetry. <clears throat> I also had, and still do have, a love for the old hymns. One day I came across the hymn Amazing Grace, and I was confident that John Newton had to have written more than this one hymn. I knew somewhat of his life and was prompted to read more about him and what he had written. Because of my reading about him, I found an unseen friend in this brother. I learned that at one time, he too felt he was displeasing to God. And he too at one time thought he had passed the point of forgiveness. The struggles he experienced were some of the very ones I was now experiencing. I also found a website with many of his poems and read them all. I felt as though my unseen friend had known I would need to read these words. I was built up for a while, but still fell back into temptation. My grandfather once said, some people have to be stabbed awake, and I did. One evening it bubbled over. My sinful nature showed it was the dominant of the two within me. There is a short verse that says, Two natures beat within my chest. One is cursed, the other blessed. 
one I love and one I hate, the one I feed will dominate. I had fed my sinful nature instead of crucify it. When I saw this blatant display of my flesh, it jarred me awake. I saw it for what it was, and I hated it. I saw how far I had fallen. Immediately after this, an overwhelming wave of shame began to wash over me. I had never felt this kind of shame before. I knew there was nothing I could do to take it away. I was so ashamed that I didn't feel it was right to show my face among the brethren anymore. I felt that my presence would be the leaven that would leaven the whole lump. I knew that I had forsaken the fountain of living water and hewed for myself broken cisterns that could hold no water. I saw the stark contrast between myself and the people of God. That night I spoke to my mother at length. I told her I didn't know how I could be forgiven, that the things I had done were shameful, that I felt I was unworthy of the love of the brethren and the love of Christ. She exhorted and encouraged me with scripture and said that the fact that I had this strong of a reaction was proof that there was still life in me. But the feeling was still there. I was convinced that because of my many sins, I was now ostracized from the kingdom of God. The next meeting we had, it was all I could do to come. I sat away from everyone and kept to myself, just hoping no one would come over. Someone did, of course. All she did was ask how I was doing, and I began to cry. I told her I was write her a note because I was too upset to talk about it right then. The note said how I felt I had fallen too far to be able to come back, and that I now knew that the things of this world could never satisfy. I identified with several passages from Jeremiah, among them, chapter 2, verse 22. For though thou wash thee with nitre, and take thee much soap, yet thine iniquity is marked before me, saith the Lord God. I knew God had beheld my wickedness, and I was more ashamed of that than anything else. I joined our brother David in praying, Cast me not away from thy presence, O Lord, and take not thy Holy Spirit from me. Restore unto me the joy of thy salvation. I remembered the faith I had as a young child and the tokens God had given me when I was seven. More than anything else, I remembered the confidence I once had that I was pleasing to God. I wanted all of it back. But I didn't think I could have these things again. It was at our next meeting that the sister gave me a note in reply. At the time, she could not have known what a help it would be to me. The Lord used her words to show me that I could come back. I could be accepted in the beloved. I could be grafted in again. I framed the note and hung it by my door so it would be the first thing I see coming home and the last thing I saw when I left, a daily reminder of my acceptance in Christ. I was determined to not lose hold of the things God had given me ever again. Despite my now repentant heart and resolve to live a godly life, the promises of my sin still lingered in every room of my home. This was an attack from the enemy, like he was saying, see what you did? How could you be a child of God and had done this? I would try to encourage myself in saying, that's not me anymore, but thoughts still crept in. I began to pray that God would occupy my mind. I didn't want to leave any place for the devil. 
One Lord's Day morning, Brother Tony Parker spoke, spoke about affections, how we need to take heed where we place them, lest they distract us from following Christ. This sermon resonated with me. I had determined what to do. <clears throat> After services ended, I all have jumped out of my seat and went back to my apartment. I grabbed a large garbage bag and threw in everything that was a distraction to me. I didn't care how much I paid for any of it. If it distracted me from Christ, I considered it trash. Amen. After this purging, I was able to enjoy a short season of peace, but the memories began to come back. The Lord provided a way of escape for me by doing something that didn't seem like a blessing at the time. My rent was raised. I couldn't afford to stay in my apartment anymore for more reasons than one now. I began to look for another place to live. Several weeks later, I found a small house that was not only larger and cheaper, but closer to the assembly. No memories of past sins linger in my home now, and the world is not welcome in it. Because of the work that God did in me, I am able to know without a shadow of a doubt that with the Lord there is mercy, and with him is plenteous redemption. Also that we must not presume upon God's grace, but he is exceeding kind and gracious. As the hymn writer wrote, I am resolved no longer to linger charmed by the world's delight. Things that are higher, things that are nobler, these have allured my sight. The taste I once had for the world is gone, and I thank God for it. Amen. For I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. The life which I now live in the flesh, I live by the faith of the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. I don't remember who said it, but I can testify to the truth that God's gifts puts man's best dreams to shame. Brethren, I was four years old at the first renewal. I grew up going to these meetings, so I consider it an honor to have been asked to testify of God's goodness and grace. But I believe that my testimony can best be summed up by the words of my unseen friend, John Newton. I am not what I ought to be. I am not what I hope to be. I am not what I wish to be, but thanks be to God, I am not what I once was, a slave to sin and Satan. And I can agree with the apostle and confess that by the grace of God, I am what I am. 